So we have been in a series looking at the book of Acts, and what I would like to do today is pick up where we left off last time. We left off in chapter 2, where the Peter and the rest of the, of the 120 who'd been in the upper room were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in languages that they had not studied. And all of a sudden, there's this, this outpouring of people talking about the wonders of God, what God has done, the mighty acts of God. And the response, you might remember, at the end of the passage we looked at last time, is everybody's standing around, all the crowds are standing around, and they're asking, what does this mean? What's going on? What's happening? And some were amazed and astounded at what they had seen. And they, they, These Galileans? They can't even speak Aramaic right, and they're speaking our language? They were astounded. And some were mocking, saying, ah, they're drunk. They're filled with too much new wine. They're just babbling. What's going on? And basically what they're asking is, what's happening and why? And isn't that a question we often ask? Why? Why is this happening? That question begins when we're, I don't know, about this big, right? When we're two, when we're one. Why? 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 It does not go away. When we get older, we ask why, but we ask different why questions. When we become teenagers, we ask different why questions. And when we become adults, we've got our own stock. Why, God? Why now? Why this? Why him? Why her? Why all of the... What's Why now? We never run out of why. And let me clue you in on a little secret. God is not afraid of why. He's not afraid of it. He's big enough to handle it. In fact, he wants it. He wants us to ask. He wants that kind of honesty and openness. And we've talked about this through our prayer study, right? We've talked about how God wants that kind of honesty. And what's going on in the crowd is they're asking, why? What's going on? What does this mean? Why is this happening? Why now? And that's where we're going to pick up. We're going to pick up what happens after the why. So I'm going to invite you, if you have your Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 2. We're going to pick up starting in verse 14. Or, of course, I'll have it on the screen. I want us to understand what's been happening. So if you missed last week or you missed what's going on, that catches you up to where we are now. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. That's 9 a.m. our time, okay? And his point in that day was nobody's drunk at 9 a.m. I don't know if that still works in our day. Depends on the person's situation. I get that. But in this day, nobody's drunk at 9 a.m. That's very weird. In fact, most Jews would not even break their fast until after their morning prayers, and your morning prayers were in the third hour at 9 a.m. So they're not even going to break their fast with breakfast, we call it, until 10 a.m. So how could they be drunk? He's like, think about this for a second. You think 120 people are all drunk at the same time at 9 a.m.? Think about the odds on that one. Not likely. Peter goes on, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And then he's going to cite a scripture from Joel, this book in the Old Testament, one of the what's called the minor prophets. Not minor because of their message, minor because of their length. They're short, right? This is what? Now, that to us in English means absolutely nothing. But in Hebrew or Aramaic, this means a whole lot. This is what? This is a formula that you would use to introduce an interpretation. And this became popularized in the late 1940s and early 1950s when we discovered a cache of documents in a cave in Qumran called the Dead Sea Scrolls, popularly, the Qumran Scrolls. And we find in these scrolls not only passages from every book in the Old Testament, but we find what's called Pesher. Pesher is commentary, right? And commentary on text, you'd have like a verse or two verses of text, and then there would be the pesher, the commentary, so this is what that means. And then a verse or two verses, this is what that means. And the pesher always begins, this is what? This is a phrase. 
what's Peter doing here? He's introducing them. He said, I'm going to tell you a scripture from the Old Testament, one that you all know because you're all observant Jews. You all know this. But this is what that means. I'm going to give you an interpretation here, and it's one that you might not have heard before, so hold on. This is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Don't miss that word. We'll come back there. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. That's interesting. In the Greco-Roman world, when you think about your young men and your old men, these, these phrases had meaning. The young meant this was somebody in the ages, age range of 18 till about 30. Then you're considered young. So if you're there, congratulations. Those of us who are not there, well, it is what it is, right? Your old men shall dream dreams. At what point do you think that started? That's a trick question, isn't it? Nobody wants to be the first one out there. When did that start in the Greco-Roman world? If you talk about someone being older, that started at age? Not 31. No, no. 60? Lower, lower. 50? Womp, womp. That's not thrilling. So, what do we see right here in this passage? We've got a reference to the last days, which we're going to talk about. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, that's new. In the Old Testament, God did not pour out the Holy Spirit on everybody. Everybody didn't get the Holy Spirit. Who got the Holy Spirit? Jews. But specifically, prophets, kings, sometimes a priest. It was always for a purpose. You would see military leaders called judges who would get the Holy Spirit for a season, but it was always temporary, and it was always for a purpose. And, and what's going on here is Joel is prophesying some 800 years prior to this, saying this is what's going to happen in the last days. Now They had a division of history. They understood a division of history. This day, what's going on right now, and the time to come. And the time to come... Well, it wasn't here yet, but it was going to start with the appearance of one called Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one. That is when the time to come would be. That's when that would begin. That's the last days. When Messiah comes, this is the beginning of the last days. How long will the last days be? Only God knows. When will Messiah come? Well, we're going to get to that in a minute. In the last days, God declares, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. What, not just the Jews? Not just the prophets or the judges or the priests or the kings? Everybody gets the Holy Spirit? Hmm. Joel's prophesying this hundreds and hundreds of years before. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Everybody? Men and women? That's unusual. That's not normal in that day. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream. So there, there's no, you don't have to be a certain age to be used by God. Even the young, even the old. Nobody, that's right. <laughs> Nobody's too old to be used by God. Hmm. And so what you see here is you begin to see a breaking down of barriers. These barriers that we erect, that we set up and say, well, if you're this, 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 then you can be used by God. And if you're not that well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Too bad. All of a sudden, what Peter stands up and says in this very first sermon after the Holy Spirit falls and they're standing there on Pentecost, things are changing. Things are changing in a very big way. And all the things that you think of as normal are about to be different. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I'll pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Wait a minute, servants? They're like at the bottom rung socioeconomically. Even they get the Holy Spirit? Yes. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Signs and wonders, that's a phrase that we have read before. You remember where we first saw signs and wonders? Way back in Exodus. 
when God says, I will perform signs and wonders. Why? To show off? No, to authenticate the message. Now, I want you to understand that what is being said is being said from God. And I'm going to authenticate that in such a way that you can't explain it any other way. These are the signs and the wonders. And all of a sudden, Peter's bringing that up. I'm going to show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, God said. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. We'll get to the day of the Lord in just a minute. It will come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what that word means, everyone? You know what that means in the original language? Everyone, that's what that means. Everybody. That means nobody's excluded. Everybody's invited. Whew. Peter's not done, but we're going to stop right there. Because this is a mouthful. Just what we've already seen. What's happening is that barriers of divisiveness are being overcome. Right here at the beginning. Right here at the start. We have talked about this before. We are really good as humans at creating barriers of divisiveness. We are really good at dividing, right? Us and them. And us and them changes depending on what you're talking about. It doesn't matter if you're talking about religion. It doesn't matter if you're talking about race. It doesn't matter if you're talking about politics. We can keep going. There's plenty of hot buttons we can hit. But we are really good at us and theming. We're really good at dividing. But what's happening here in Acts chapter 2 is from the very beginning, God is saying, I want something different for my new community, what we know as the church. I want something different to happen here. I don't want those divisive attitudes brought in here. I don't want those dividing walls brought in here. Because in here, we're supposed to be brothers and sisters. We're supposed to be all together, unified with one Father, all of us. This is different. This is unique. And this is not something that they had ever expected or anticipated. But Peter's going to proclaim this, and then they're going to unpack it. And that's really the rest of the book of Acts. If you really want to characterize Acts, it is unpacking what's happening here in this sermon. Because all of these barriers that we are so good at using to divide, gender, race, age, nationality, language, socioeconomic status, and social class, all of these barriers we're going to see fall one at a time. But it all starts here. It all starts in this message that Peter delivers at Pentecost. Because the new community, the church of God, is going to be different. It's supposed to look different. It's supposed to feel different. It's supposed to be a place where you find community, where you are accepted, where you are loved. Because the love of God is not something we receive just for us. It's something we are to receive for us and then share with those around us. That's the whole point. And how do you do that if you're intent on erecting barriers? You can't do it. And this is why, here at the very outset, God's going to make this abundantly clear so that nobody can miss it. And really, we've gotten this right now for 2,000 years since this day, haven't we? We've been so good at this, at making sure that these walls never get put back up. Right? Yay us! Go us! Well done! No, no. In fact, we haven't. And at different times in different places in history, We've screwed this up good and proper. We've messed it up. But that's why we're going back to the beginning to understand what God's intent was so that we can restore. Because God's not done yet. Have I mentioned that today? God's not done yet. He's not. Now we looked last week at a verse in the first part of chapter 2 that I called attention to and I want to make sure you don't forget it. Who got filled with the Holy Spirit? All of them. All the followers of Jesus. All 120 of them. This is not just for a select few. This is not just for the guys. This is not just for this subsection. This is all 120 who've been gathering, praying in the upper room. They've all been filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't miss that. I love how N.T. Wright talks about this, one of my favorite New Testament scholars. He says, the work of God is wonderfully inclusive because there's no category of people which is left out. Both genders, all ages, all social classes, but it is wonderfully focused because it happens to all who call on the name of the Lord. And there's your distinction. The Holy Spirit is not poured out on everybody indiscriminately, no matter what they believe or where they are. It's poured out on those who 
call on the name of the Lord, and there's your distinction. This is the differentiator. Everybody's invited. Everybody can come be a part of this new community. There are no barriers. There are no walls. But the one thing we all have in common to be brothers and sisters is that we have one Father. And the only way we can have one Father is because of the work that Jesus did. That's it. There's no other way. This is what Jesus said. We, sung this, we sang this earlier. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. That's it. No other way. It's wonderfully inclusive. And it's wonderfully focused. Well, Peter is communicating what he wants the people to understand that day, that morning, is that Joel's prophecy from 800 years prior has come to pass. The Holy Spirit's been poured out, and we all, we're all here. And you see this gift of languages, this gift of tongues that you're experiencing right now. You can understand me in your language, whatever that is. That's because of God's Holy Spirit. That's because of the work of the Spirit that is in me and through me. And Peter wants everybody to get this. He wants them to understand it. Now, he referenced the day of the Lord, which is something that Joel talks about. And, and Joel mentions this in passing, but it was a concept that was, that was developed over time. The day of the Lord was not a day like you and I think about a day. It's not like, hey, it's going to be on June the 23rd. It's not the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord was bigger than that. The day of the Lord was the inauguration and the ongoing nature of the messianic reign. When Messiah comes, when the anointed one, the promised one comes, that will be the beginning of the day of the Lord, but it will not be the end. The end of the day of the Lord will not be until he returns and the beginning of his kingdom is fully realized. So the day of the Lord has already begun now. And it has not yet been consummated. It's already here. But it's not yet done. We're in the middle. One author I read described it this way. We, we live in the grand parenthesis. Between the trees. You have the trees in the Garden of Eden at the beginning. You have the trees in the New Jerusalem at the end. And we live in the grand parenthesis. And I love that. We are in the day of the Lord. Now, this is the inauguration, what we're reading about, the day of the Lord, the time when Messiah comes. And every time you see Lord referenced, Peter's referring not just to God, which is how that word had been used prior, but he's referring specifically to Jesus. That's new. And we're going to see that as we unpack farther into what Peter says in his message that day, and we'll hit that next week. Listen to this quote. What did that mean, the last days? We referenced that at the beginning. Peter said, in the last days. It was a general term for the time to come, the time when promises will be fulfilled, the story would arrive at its climax, the journey would reach its destination. And so, all sorts of new things would start to happen. This was their understanding of what they called Olam Haba, the time to come. What's going to happen? Well, that's, that's when everything, the promises will be kept. That's when we get to the pinnacle of the story. And all sorts of new things start to happen. Had anybody ever experienced what happened that morning at Pentecost before? No. This is a reversal of what happened at Babel. We talked about this last week. This is not, they've not been divided by language where they can't understand one another. Now, that barrier has been removed. Now they can understand one another. All sorts of new things would start to happen. The Holy Spirit's been poured out on all 120 men and women, young and old. Whoa, that's new. That's never happened before. All sorts of new things begin to happen. And one of those new things Peter describes is that the men and the women will prophesy. Prophecy is a gift, and it is a spiritual gift. And spiritual gifts are something that, that is that are often misunderstood. And if you've ever heard teaching on this that's confusing, let me just apologize for that, because it can be confusing. I get that. What I want to do is, is talk about it in a way that I hope makes sense. Spiritual gifts are one component of what it means for you to be you. When you become a follower of Jesus, we read in the New Testament that you receive at least one spiritual gift. That's something that God gives you. 
Who decides what spiritual gifts you get? God does. You don't. I didn't. God decides. He determines what gift he will give you, right? But that's one component, your spiritual gifts. How you use that gift is going to differ, and the way it's going to differ is depending on the passion that God has put in your heart, right? So you think for a second, that's another piece of your passion. Uh, and, uh, think about this uh, spiritual gift of teaching, right? What I use every week, right? This is one of the gifts that God has given me for his glory. What, what does that look like in here? Well, it looks like this. But teaching adults and teaching two-year-olds is a little bit different, right? How do you know how to use your gift? How do you, how do you know where to use your gift? Well, that has to do with your passion area. I like to see light bulbs go off. I like to see it when somebody gets it, right? That's part of the teaching gift. Like, you can tell when somebody receives what it is that you're transmitting, right? And so that means that my passion needs to be with people who are going to get what I'm talking about. I'm not really good with two-year-olds, right? I hope I'm better with y'all. That is how I know how to use it. But there's another component to our Venn diagram, and that is skills or talents. These are things that you have learned how to do over time. No spiritual gift arrives fully developed. You don't get it day one of being a follower of Jesus, and it's already at max capacity in your life. If you need evidence of that, all you have to do is go back and listen to the first teaching I ever did. And that would be all the evidence you need. You could do that if I hadn't made sure every copy was destroyed. No one needs to be subjected to that ever again, and I should apologize to all the people who had to sit through it. That's a skill. It's a talent. It's something that you, that you develop over time. You get better at this. It takes intentionality. It takes work. It takes effort. It didn't just happen. Nobody wakes up one day and says, oh, wow, my spiritual gift is fully developed. I don't know how that happened, but here I am. Never works that way. I have to work at this. I have to get better at it. I have to evaluate if you do not evaluate, you do not get better, which means I have to watch and listen to myself. I despise that. I do not want to watch and listen to myself teach. But that's how I learn what I do that's, just, that's annoying and distracting so that you don't have to listen to it and watch it. That's how you get better. That's how I learn what connects and what doesn't. It's through evaluation. Learning how your spiritual gifts, your passions, and your talents intersect that creates what I call your ministry sweet spot. It's like the sweet spot on a bat, right? If you're swinging a bat, you want to make sure that you are going to hit the ball on the sweet spot of the bat, because if you do that, you're going to get maximum distance. And this is what I want for every follower of Jesus. I want you to understand where your sweet spot is. And this is what I work with people on. I try to help you discover your sweet spot. Sometimes we say, okay, you've got this spiritual gift. Do you think it would work here? Let's try it. Let's try it here. And that person will come back to me and say, well, that was abysmal. I hated that. That was terrible. I never want to do anything ever again. Okay, no, that's just not a good fit. Let's try over here. And sometimes it takes three or four or five tries before we find the sweet spot. That's okay. You learned some ways that didn't work. I love how Thomas Edison, was when he was asked, hey, what did it feel like to fail 10,000 times when you were trying to create a light bulb? What did that feel like? Like, you just, you just feel like a failure? And he said, I beg your pardon, I did not fail 10,000 times. I learned 10,000 ways that didn't work. See the difference? What I want to do is I want to help people figure out where their sweet spot is, and sometimes that means you learn what's not a good fit. That's okay. When people step up to serve here, they don't step up to serve, and you're locked in from now until Jesus comes. That was your first shot. That's it. You're locked in. No. We will help you. We will work with you. We will help you navigate and try different things until you find that place that feels like, I'm a, yeah, this is, this is what God created me to do. Yeah, this feels, this feels like I'm not just receiving the gift of God, but I'm actually using that gift for the benefit of other people. This, this feels like I'm in my sweet spot. And you know it when you experience it. And this is what I want for every person who follows Jesus. I want them to discover this and experience it and experience God flowing not just to them, but through them. The Holy Spirit is not just for you to receive. 
Holy Spirit is for you to receive and share. So why does God give spiritual gifts? What's the point? Peter tells us this. Peter tells us this. It's always, every gift that is given is given not just for you. It's given for the benefit of those around you so that they will understand something more about God, so that they will benefit in some way from the gift that God has given you. Jenna mentioned earlier that we have volunteers right now who are serving downstairs taking care of kids. Is that benefiting anyone in the room? Yeah, the parents, absolutely. That's huge. If they're in their sweet spot, then it's not a drudgery for them. It's not something they're just watching the clock, saying, when will he stop talking? If they're in their sweet spot, it's something that they love doing. Because they're experiencing not just the Holy Spirit flowing to them, but through them. And they're pouring into the next generation, helping them to understand and experience the love of God. It's not just downstairs, is it? We heard about student camp earlier. We had volunteers who took our kids to camp and stayed with them all the time for a week. For some of you, this is your gift, and you're like, man, it sounds like so much fun. And for some of you, you're like, what do I have to pay not to do that? <laughs> That's awful. I don't want to do that. It's not your gift. I don't want you serving in a place that's not your gift. I don't. That's a recipe for burnout and disaster, quite frankly. I want you serving in a place where you're using your gifts, your passions, your talents, where they intersect in that sweet spot for the benefit of other people. The absolute last thing anybody should ever do is serve out of guilt or need because those are incredibly short-term motivators that will burn you out. Don't do that. Instead, ask the question, what, what is it God has gifted me to do? And, and why did God give me that gift? Well, obviously for the benefit of other people. Sometimes people will say, you know, I feel a little dry spiritually. I feel like I'm just, I'm kind of dried out. Like I'm not really growing. I'm not really thriving. I'm just surviving. You know what my first question is? Where are you serving other people? And you know what the answer is almost invariably? I'm not. Well, what happens if you have a body of water that has an inlet and no outlet? We have one of those. Do you know that? It's in the Middle East. It's called the Dead Sea. Nothing can live there. It has an inlet. It has no outlet. Is that who you want to be? That's not who I want to be. So how do you fix it? Well, you have an outlet. That's why you're serving other people. That's understanding your spiritual gift, understanding your passions and how they intersect that, whatever skills and talents that you have that help you to do what it is God's called you to do. I was having a conversation downstairs with somebody this morning, and God has given him the gift of knowing how to work with technology and such. It's a wonderful gift. And he was talking about running some cabling and terminating the cables, and I was like, man, I'm so glad you know how to do that. Is that a spiritual gift, knowing how to terminate Cat 5 e cable? Is that a spiritual gift? Not listed. I would argue that it could be, right? That's a skill or a talent that he's picked up along the way, that he's learned. But his spiritual gift is service, help, helping other people. Where does his spiritual gift and his talent and his passion intersect? Exactly what he's doing making it so that you have a great environment where if you want to pull out your phone and use Wi-Fi to take notes, you can do that. Creating an environment where our kids are safe. That's important. Everything that God has put in your life is put in your life for a reason. There is no such thing as a wasted experience. Here's the key from what Peter is saying here. Once you understand what yours is, the question is, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? It's not given to you just for you. And if you sit and do nothing with it, then you will become like the Dead Sea. You got an inlet, you got no outlet. And over time, you get stagnant, stale, you're not growing. In fact, there's really nothing going on. 
What Peter wants to communicate through the words of the prophet Joel is that the presence of the Holy Spirit completely transforms people, no matter who or what they were before. And, and I know that because he's pointing out these walls, these barriers falling. There are places, I'm sad to say, where you're not welcome to use your gifts. There are places where I'm sad to say, where, hey, you know what, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you're not the right gender. You can't use your gifts. Here's my problem with that. I'm going to go back to the question that you've heard me ask 100,000 times. What does Scripture say? What does Scripture say? I'm always going to go back to Scripture. What does Scripture say? Scripture says the Holy Spirit fell on all of them. And Peter begins by quoting from the prophet Joel. This is what Joel means. This is what it means. You ready? Everybody's in the game. Everybody gets to play. Everybody gets to use their gifts for the benefit of other people. I don't care who you are, where you've been, what you've done. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've been given a spiritual gift and you get to play. Are you ready? This is where Peter starts. This is not where he's going to finish. But notice the last thing he quotes from Joel. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone. Everybody's invited. There is a sense in our world, in, in too many churches, I think, where, hey, you know, well, if, you know, if they knew what I'd done, if they knew where I'd been, they, they wouldn't want me to be a part of doing anything. I, I can't. If they knew what I was like yesterday, they wouldn't want me. To. Guess what? Every person in this room could say that. Every one of us. Every one of us could point to stuff in our lives that we would not put, want put up on the big screens. Amen? Every one of us. Right? We're all messed up. We're all sinful. We're all broken. There's nobody, starting with this guy, who's going to stand up and say, look at me, be like me, because I am perfect. Uh-uh. If perfection is the requirement in order to use your gifts, none of us could. You know what the requirement is for those to use their gifts? You know what the requirement is? It's right here. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. That's the starting point. Are you a follower of Jesus? Have you said yes to your heavenly Father? Do you know your gifts? Are you willing to use them? Are you willing to step out in a way that may be uncomfortable at first? Because it often is. The very first time I stood up to teach, I just really wanted to throw up. The 400th time I stood up to teach, I just really wanted to throw up. Here, 26 years later, there are times I still really want to throw up. It's not comfortable. But the question is this, are you willing to step out of your comfort zone? If God has given you a gift in order to serve other people, you get to choose. That's part of free will. You get to decide. But the one thing I want you to hear loud and clear is that nobody is excluded. Everybody gets to play. Everybody gets to be a part of this. Because all of those barriers that matter so much out in the world are not to matter in the new community. They're not to matter in here. This is why the question that I ask for any role here at Southview is, are they gifted? Meaning, do they have the gifts? Has God given them the gifts to do this thing? And are they called by God to do this thing? Those are the only two questions that matter. That's it. Gender, race, socioeconomic status, language, nationality, all these things that we put on the list. These don't matter. Are you gifted? Are you called? And if that's true, then come on the team. We got a jersey for you. We're ready for you. We need you. Because if not everybody is going to use their gifts for the benefit of other people, there are going to be holes. And there are going to be people who do not get blessed because of your gift. There are going to be people who lose out because you're not willing to share your gift with other people. Does that mean you're going to be perfect at it all the time? You're going to get it right 100% of the time? No. Have you ever heard me give a teaching that wasn't great? Yes. Sometimes you swing and you miss. But you get back up. 
you come back to bad again. This is what I want you to understand. There's not an expectation of perfection. But there is an expectation of willingness. Are we going to be willing? If we call on the name of the Lord, that means that we say Jesus is Lord. That is the oldest confession of faith. Jesus is Lord. If we say that, then we go with what he says. And what Jesus taught, and what we see taught throughout the pages of the New Testament, is that God gives us experiences, he gives us gifts, he gives us passions, he gives us talents and skills, not just for us, but for the benefit of those around us. And your gender, and your race, and your socioeconomic status, and your nationality, and your language, and all those things that matter out there do not matter in here. And will not matter in here. Because one day, like that verse we looked at last week, one day we are all going to gather around the throne. People from every nation, every tribe, every tongue. And we are going to have the world's biggest worship service. And it's going to be amazing. You saw the kids at camp jumping and celebrating? Yeah, it's going to be like times a thousand. And you and I are going to be jumping together. There's going to be this giant mosh pit right in front of the throne. It's going to be great. I don't even know what that means. But it's going to be great. We're going to have so much fun. Because Jesus is our Lord. And we're going to celebrate him together. And I can't wait for that day. But until then, it's time to suit up. And we need you. We need all of you. The kingdom needs all of you. People who are far from God need all of you. That's our mission. It's to reach people who don't know yet. That's why God put this church on this corner. Are you in? You're not excluded. You're invited. We're going to be out at the tent after the service today. And if you're ready to suit up, you're ready to step into this and begin to use your gifts for the benefit of, other, of others and not just sit and soak and sour, you're ready to, you're ready to play. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to help you find that fit. You get to see people using their gifts up here every week. Do you see all the people up here today using their gifts? Electric guitar, acoustic guitar, bass guitar, keys, vocals, drums. Using their gifts. There's a hundred more you never see that are behind the scenes. Setting up the coffee. Getting here early. Unlock the doors. Turn on the board. Hide in the back. Making sure that you can see and hear. So many opportunities to serve. The question is, will you? You're invited. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're equipped. And we're here to help. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, may today this message resonate so deeply that no one is excluded, that everyone is invited. I imagine there are people in the room who've heard something different before. And I'm as sorry as I can be about that. Because I don't believe that's your heart. As I read your scripture, it seems so abundantly clear to me that you invite all. You poured your spirit on all. And the divisions that we so often create in our world have no place in your new community, in the church. May we understand that we all have one Father in you. That you pour out your Spirit on all who call on the name of Jesus. And pouring out your Spirit on us is not just for us. It's for the benefit of those around us. May we take that seriously. And may we steward well what you have placed in our lives, our gifts, our passions, and our talents. May we commit today, in this moment, to use those for your glory, for your kingdom, for your church, so that people far from God would be raised to new life in Jesus. And all God's people agreed together and said, Amen.
so good to see all of you. We're out of the tent. I and the rest of the team, we'd love to talk with you, and I'll see you next Sunday.